Hi, everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn from the Nightlife Programming Team. And I'm Christina from helping to produce Nightlife. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Tonight's Night School is all about wildlife in the city, how wildlife has shaped where we live, and how we are shaping wildlife. From New York City to Tacoma and across the Bay and Berkeley, we're bringing you three amazing guests who also happen to be friends to share with us how species, how species are evolving in response to city life. So first up, someone you might recognize if you have been to many nightlifes over the past 10 years, um, Elizabeth Carlin, who used to work in the mammalogy department here at the Academy. Um, but she is now in New York City, um, stalking pigeons, and um, she's studying the effects of cities on the evolution of animals, specifically pigeons. Um, next up, we have Max Lambert, um, who's a po postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley and he studies how amphibians are evolving to live in cities, and in some, their stormwater ponds. And then finally, we have Dr. Christopher Shelf from the University of Washington in Tacoma, who's talking about a recent paper he authored about how structural inequalities affect not only cities and humans, but also the wildlife that live in them. And as always, we are live. So please say hi, let us know where you're watching from share any comments or questions in the chat. We'll be bringing Liz, Max, and Chris together at the end for a group discussion and a Q&A. So make sure to get your questions in and stay till the end. Uh, up first is Liz. Hello, um, hopefully, hi. Uh, hopefully y'all can hear and see me. And uh, my name is Elizabeth Carlin. I am currently in my sixth year of my PhD at Fordham University in New York City. So you're gonna have to forgive me. I'm on East Coast time and it's quite late for me. Uh, I, was, I was up early in the lab this morning. But I'm really excited to be back at Nightlife. This is one of my favorite events when it's going on in person. And I'm really glad that there's been this rendition going on online since we haven't been able to, uh, to meet in person. And it's nice that I can join you from New York. So I wanted to tell you today a little bit about my research and about kind of what just urban evolution in general. Why are we studying this field? So first I want to kind of show you, this is this GIF of Shanghai over the past 30 years. And what you're seeing here is just this massive expansion of urbanization to the point where they're actually building out into the water here on the right hand side of the screen as the city just continues to expand um, over, over these three decades. So along with urbanization comes what you might expect, increased buildings and roads or what we call impervious surfaces because they're not pervious to water. Increased habitat fragmentation, y'all might recognize San Francisco here. And you can see how kind of fragmented the habitat is. We have the Presidio over on the left here of the screen, and then Golden Gate Park and the Academy over here someplace. Um, but, but these parks are pretty fragmented and split up from each other. So if you're an animal that's reliant on tree cover and, uh, grassy space. You're gonna have. You're going to have a really difficult time moving. Let's say from the Presidio to Golden Gate Park, and if you're trying to get to downtown San Francisco, you're gonna have an even more difficult time because there's just so little cover for you to to move through. So there's often this increased habitat fragmentation in cities. We also see increased air pollution. Y'all are probably familiar with this. If you're in the Bay Area, there's been fires, but also just smog pollution. And we have spare the air days in the Bay Area. And just kind of around the world, there's just this massive increase in air pollution and increase in these environmental toxins. And whoops, backwards. <laughs> um, Along with this increased environmental toxins, we see this increased light at night. So what you're seeing here is an image of the world at night, and you can see how lit up the regions are, the different regions are. 
I don't know why it keeps going forward. So you can see that you can see the outlines of most of the areas, um, like the Northeast and places in India and China, and even here along the Nile River. So we're drastically changing the world around us with this urbanization. And if you can imagine, as an animal, there's a bunch of new things that you have to deal with. So if there's increased light at night, maybe the insects are out and buzzing around the lights, you might see some indications of changes in nocturnal behavior when an animal is hunting. And one of kind of the best examples, I think, of urban evolution is shown by Kristen Winchell in her dissertation research where she looked at lizards, anole lizards in Puerto Rico, and found that lizards in Puerto Rico have longer legs and stickier feet that allow them to move more easily through and on urban substrates. And you can imagine that urban substrates like metal and painted concrete and glass are a lot smoother and harder to hold on to than trees or or even leaves. And so these anoles in urban areas of Puerto Rico actually have more toe pads, more lamellae that allow them to better cling to these urban surfaces. So this is kind of what you might think of as adaptive evolution, probably what most of you all are familiar with. Uh, this natural selection that selects for feet that are better able to cling to these surfaces. But, and you can imagine that because this is what Puerto Rico used to look like. And this is where, what it looks like now. This is actually one of the universities that Kristen conducted this research at in Arecibo in Puerto Rico. And so going from this, this quite natural habitat to this very urban habitat, you can kind of think about this is a big change and this is a big selection force acting upon these, these lizards. Now, my PhD advisor, kind of the thing that got me into this field of urban evolution, it found that within mice, these are white-footed mice that are native to New York City and, and continue to exist here, but only tend to live in the park areas. They are, they're not on the the city streets like house mice might be. And they're, they're typically not going to be going into apartment buildings. So uh, Jason Munchie South, my PhD advisor, found that restricted gene flow across New York City leads to population differentiation across uh, parks of these urban white-footed mice. So he could actually take a mouse that he didn't know where it was from and compare it to mice from Central Park and parks in the Queens and parks in the Bronx. And he could tell you where that mouse came from based on its genotype. And again, this makes sense. This is, a, first of all, this is a, a form of non-adaptive evolution, kind of um, to, to counter what a, adaptive evolution is. This type of evolution is random and isn't necessarily due to selection forces. It's just, randomly happening. You got you all are probably familiar with something like a bottleneck effect when only a few individuals arrive on an island. And it just happens that random sampling means that you might not get a full representation of the source population. And we have that occurring here basically in these small uh, parks in New York City where there's these either large bottleneck effects or because of because mice can't get from Central Park up to to these parks in the Bronx, there's there's no gene flow, and so after a couple hundred years, we start to see population differentiation. And again, just to kind of show you what Manhattan used to look like, this is Northern Manhattan, actually where I live, and this is kind of this representation from the Manahata project, which uh, is run by WCS and Eric Sanderson, which is a phenomenal project. If you're interested in the history of Manhattan, I highly recommend this. So this is what Manhattan used to look like, and this is what that area looks like today. And you can see that even though there is green space up here, it's again, 
highly, highly fragmented. And Central Park is all the way down here at the top of the slide. So kind of going back to what Manhattan used to look like and what it looks like now, there has been this massive fragmentation of the population, or of the green space leading to uh, fragmentation of the mouse population and population differentiation. So these two examples were of native species, but what about species that live in close association with and benefit from humans? Often these organisms are so integrated into our cities that we don't even notice them. And most urban evolution studies have really focused on native organisms, but I think that there's a lot to learn from organisms like human commensals pictured here. Let's see, these rats, these mice and pigeons that not only persist, but these animals really thrive in urban areas. So just to kind of give you a little bit of background on some pigeons, y'all have probably seen a pigeon, maybe today, but they are native to Asia, North Africa, and Southern Europe. They were domesticated around five to 10,000 years ago, originally as a food source, but as chicken became more popular, chicken and other poultry became popular, people began breeding pigeons for their racing ability and for their show traits. So what you're seeing here is actually a show pigeon with these curly, curly feathers, which I think is awesome that this is this has kind of been bred in to this pigeon. And again, this different coloration from the wild type pigeon. Pigeons eat an incredibly diverse and omnivorous diet. This is a pic picture that I took in New York City of pigeons eating a donut. Someone had come and dumped out an entire bag of donuts for them and they were, they were just really enjoying this snack. And pigeons also have an incredibly rapid reproduction and fast population turnover. So you probably have never seen a baby pigeon. You might be wondering where all those baby pigeons are and they're in the nest and they don't leave the nest until they're almost full grown and really looking like adult pigeons. And they can, pigeons can, will lay a clutch of two eggs about every six weeks if the conditions are right. And because cities are warmer and there's often this constant source of food, they can really continue uh, to, to produce young almost year round. So for my dissertation project, I wanted to look at the Northeast megacity. Those of you on the West Coast might not be kind of familiar with, uh, with the megalopolis, but it's this idea of from Boston down to Washington, D.C. is one giant megacity. But when you're looking kind of at this area and we're Right here, we're, we're looking at a map of impervious surface. So the, the redder areas on the map are more built up space. And we can kind of see that each city is isolated uh, from one another, that they, they don't quite seem as connected maybe as we would think. But when we look at this same area at night, what we really see is that Boston and Providence look like one big city. There's a break in Connecticut as we move kind of into more suburban areas in Connecticut. And then as we move down from New York City all the way down to Washington, DC, we're getting one kind of giant city again. So these were my sampling sites and I, I went to each of these six cities and caught pigeons. And to kind of give you an idea of what that looked like, what that looks like, I wanted to show you this video. This is how I ended up catching pigeons. This is a net gun. It does not hurt the pigeons. The pigeons are kind of gathered here to, to feed. Uh, and then the net gun kind of goes out over them, captures them in this flock. I caught about 10 individuals, which is more than I needed from this one sampling location. And then uh, pretty quickly, we're able to get the pigeons out of the net and take some blood from them to do DNA analysis and then let the pigeons go. So that blood came back with me to the lab and I did reduced representation genome sequencing, which I'm not really going to get into because it's not that interesting. Anyway, I got basically um, 
I got to compare genomes of these pigeons. And what I found when I started to run analyses was that the New York City and Washington DC to Washington DC, that area pulled out as one population. And then Boston and Providence pulled out as a different population that was separate from this, this New York, Washington DC population. So that's kind of leading me to think that something about Connecticut is really driving this difference in, in pigeon biology. And, and that kind of makes sense when we, when we think about it because we see pigeons in urban areas. We don't see pigeons in the suburbs. And so they really are these, this organism that is really able to take advantage of, of the urbanization and as are actually kind of inhibited by, by this more suburban area. So that's kind of some basic stuff on my dissertation research. I'm happy to talk to you all about random pigeon questions that you have, uh, but I'm also really excited to hear from Max and Chris about, about their research uh, and, and the really awesome things that they've been finding. So I'm going to hand things back over to them. Hey all, uh, I'm Max Lambert. I'm a postdoc at UC Berkeley. That's my screens to share real quick. You can kind of see that. Um, it's great to be here tonight to chat with you all about some of the work that I've been doing um, recently on amphibians and cities, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. Um, this uh, cover slide I can tell is a little, a little misleading because it's not actually an amphibian, it's an amphibious reptile. This is the uh, Western pond turtle, an endangered species here in California. Uh, I do a lot of work on this species in urban areas, kind of from Davis into the Bay Area. Um, it's a really cool species, I love this. So if you're really curious to hear about um, urban turtles, particularly in the age of the pandemic, when we have to do uh, field research in the heat and smoke with a uh, mask on, uh, definitely shoot me an email. Um, but today I wanna to talk to you about my other uh, wildlife love, which are amphibians. So frogs, toads, and salamanders. Um, some really phenomenally charismatic species, some of which can do really, really well in urban areas. Uh, some of which are a little more sensitive and some of which just can't get there at all. Um, and I've studied urban amphibians from as far east in the United States as Connecticut, Washington, DC, um, all the way here to the Bay Area and up into uh, Portland and Seattle in the Northwest. Um, and today I want to talk about some of the, re some of the ways in which we found um, urbanization is, is limiting the success of amphibians um, in our cities and kind of ways in which we're thinking about innovating new conservation methods um, for how we deal with amphibians in both created and natural ponds and other freshwater areas um, in our cities and suburbs. Now when it comes to cities, you know, you've heard Liz talk about some of the ways in which um, uh, wildlife may be limited in their ability to move around and they're dealing with pollutants and other sort of stressors. Um, and with amphibians, there's kind of two main things that we really think about for, for why they can't be super duper successful um, in urban places. Now for a lot of animals, uh, like amphibians, uh, they're really playing a, a life and death version of Frogger. Um, so the network of roads and highways we've built around our um, cities and in and around our cities um, takes a real serious toll on a lot of frogs and salamanders. They're very slow moving, most of them. They don't really like crossing pavement, and when they try to, they can get smashed pretty fast. Um, if you consider it a couple ponds in a forest, it's pretty easy for a frog to navigate, you know, a forest and woodland and move from pond to pond. But you pop, plop those same two ponds in the middle of a city, uh, it's a pretty good chance that frog can get smashed by a Tesla or a Mack truck. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we really think there's a, a hard time for a lot of frogs and salamanders from um, not only getting into a city, but navigating from place to place within a city. Now, from my perspective, the other really big thing we think about when it comes to amphibians um, is chemical pollution. Uh, I've done a lot of work and my colleagues have done a lot of work over uh, a number of years now, really showcasing a really diverse number of pollutants uh, that we put into the environment, um, particularly in urbanized areas um, and from a lot of sources. So anyway, some of these freshwater ponds and lakes and streams we have um, in our urban areas, they are getting impacted by chemicals coming from leaky septic systems and sanitary sewers. Um, runoff over our buildings and roads that get funneled really easily into ponds and lakes. Um, the chemicals that we put onto our lawns or that parks use for the vegetation, landscaping, all of this stuff kind of works its way down into these water bodies. Um, and for aquatic wildlife like fish, some insects, and a lot of amphibians, uh, 
um, that can do some serious damage. Um, kind of challenge we've had as ecologists and conservation biologists, though, is that most of the work we have on toxicology and um, urban pollution with amphibians is really coming from laboratories. And we don't really have a good sense of how pollution that's actually experienced by um, wild amphibians in our cities really impacts them. And so that's kind of big, the big crux of a lot of my research is how much does urban pollution actually matter um, for the success of some amphibians in our, our cities and other urban environments. Um, and today I want to tell you about some of the work that I've been doing with colleagues um, with the City of Portland Parks and Recreation and City of Gresham Environmental Services, folks at the USGS and a number of other colleagues to really start tackling this question a little more deeply. Um, and one of the kind of uh, bodies of water that I really enjoy working in now are what are called stormwater ponds. Some folks call them retention ponds. Um, but these are completely unnatural ponds out there in urban landscapes um, that are made by people predominantly for uh, the reason of taking care of flood water or stormwater. Um, so in a lot of places when it, when it rains, that water has to go somewhere. And it's really hard for water to penetrate asphalt or concrete um, and buildings. And so what ends up happening is that water sits there and it percolates up and it can flood our roads, it can flood our houses, it can flood our businesses. And so one of the ways we deal with stormwater is to actually pipe it out and put it somewhere, oftentimes creating ponds um, uh, that can hold that water. Um, oftentimes these ponds are created to kind of help filter out some sediment and other pollutants before they kind of work their way through um, the environment into streams and eventually the ocean. Um, now some of these ponds are built to be just kind of big not particularly appealing concrete basins that kind of fill up with gunky sediment like you see here in this pond. Um, not super duper appealing to us and not to many wildlife either. Um, though some birds will use this and, and some other animals as well. Um, then you have other ponds that look just absolutely gorgeous. So the pond like this is also a human created stormwater pond. It catches stormwater running off of uh, dozens if not hundreds of acres of urban development. Um, in Portland, it's created to look very much like a natural pond and it functions very similarly to a natural pond, um, except for that it collects a ton of pollutants that come in with that stormwater and, and plenty of wild animals use this kind of um, pond. And so I'm really curious about how, when we create these kind of aquatic habitats, um, how does the pollution that's associated with the creation of these things really impact the frogs um, that might happen to find them? And if we want to put more frogs out here in our cities, um, does the pollution in these things, in these ponds really impact these animals? And besides water that gets these ponds, some other things that are associated with that. And of course, we have kind of uh, very common frogs like coarse frogs just colonize ponds pretty quickly and they can lay their eggs and breed. Um, but as water washes its way in these ponds, you get a bunch of other things that wash in there with it. Um, so I found everything as weird as a single random boot and backpack and uh, maybe it's a syringe there. Um, someone's half eaten bagel or breakfast, plenty of uh, Nerf gun darts end up in these stormwater ponds that flow through hundreds sometimes in the given pond and some uh, creepy uh, little half beaten up uh, kids dolls. So plenty of litter and trash get flown in with these amphibians um, and, and water as, as storms hit these urban, urban surfaces and, and work their way into the ponds. Um, but as a topic for a different day, we're gonna focus today on the kind of litter we don't actually see, um, are certain kind of pollutants we don't actually see in ponds that are really invisible to us, but are really still there and pretty impactful to aquatic life, um, unlike litter like those like those dolls or the half-eaten bagels. And one of the ways that we've actually figured out a way to do this is by creating these really kind of unique enclosures that we can build into ponds in the middle of cities and kind of in the, the happy forests surrounding our, our cities. Um, these are uh, kind of Weirdly expensive, but also kind of cheaply made uh, enclosures made of window screening and PVC pipe that are pretty sturdy. You can take a pretty big beating when you have a, a gallons of water flowing against them. And we can collect little freshly egg, laid egg masses from frogs and then raise them in these enclosures. And the really cool thing is that we can put these enclosures in three to five foot deep water and we can collect these embryos that are a single cell laid by these frogs in the environment, um, put them in these enclosures for months on end and watch as these eggs develop into weird kind of fish-like embryos to hatch and become tadpoles. And we can watch as those tadpoles, hopefully, if we're lucky, um, grow their four legs and eventually metamorphose into baby frogs. We can do all this in these really cool enclosures um, in the middle of these urban ponds, whether these ponds are created ponds that we make or whether they are natural ponds that happen to uh, survive people draining them. And so what I want to do is share kind of um, a few stories from over the past year's research we've been doing um, from a few different ponds and kind of give you an idea of what we learned about really the interesting impacts of pollution um, on amphibians, particularly in Portland, Oregon.
So this is one of my favorite ponds. This is um, several decades old. It's a pond that the arrow is pointing to. is completely unnatural. We made it. We built it. Not we, me personally, but uh, the county and city did. It's right behind a school and it's surrounded by pretty dense suburbs um, and commercial development to the south of it. And it collects dozens or hundreds of acres of urban development's water when the storms come in, um, particularly in winter and early spring. Um, it dries up for part of the year, but it holds water long enough for, for frogs to come and breed in it. Um, and this is kind of what the pond looks like when you're actually in the middle of it. This is February when it snowed on us, which is pretty numbingly cold, um, but it actually looks pretty good. It's a pretty good natural happy pond. Um, it's a few feet deep. It's, it's really pretty, um, but it does have a ton of uh, diversity of pollutants that get in there. Um, again, because it's catching water from um, our neighborhood streets, from commercial streets, and from the school here. Um, but what's really neat is that this uh, species called the red-legged frog, which is a declining species across the Northwest, has managed to find its way through kind of that messy urban road matrix and start breeding. It has a really big population here in this pond. Um, and for a long time, the actual tadpoles that metamorphose out of this pond had some really kind of funky deformities. They had these kind of Pinocchio faces. Um, they had some bizarre legs. And eventually those went away. The frogs actually started metamorphosing uh, much more healthy looking um, after a chunk of time. And we actually learned something pretty interesting out of this pond. Um, for decades back in the 20th century, uh, kind of our motto, our mantra for thinking about chemical contamination was that the solution to pollution is dilution, which really means when you have toxins in the environment, add more water and dilute it and hopefully it goes away. Uh, we've since learned that's not really how that works and even very uh, low concentrations of contaminants can have really important impacts on, on wild animals and human health. Um, but this pond taught something actually really interesting. Um, sometimes the solution to pollution may not be dilution, but evolution. Um, and in this case, we've actually learned that this population of frogs here has actually adapted relatively quickly in just a couple of decades, um, which is a, a, you know, a dozen or so frog generations um, to the contaminants coming in this pond. And they actually survive much better with the water pollution here than frogs that might be trying to colonize it from somewhere else that haven't, hasn't experienced this pollution. Um, so it's really kind of a nice example of how some populations of wild amphibians can be uh, pretty resilient and adapt to the kind of chemical onslaught we give them uh, from pretty nasty chemicals, uh, chemical cocktails. Now, another kind of happy, positive success story um, is this uh, pond here the arrow is pointing to. It's in a super industrial commercial area of Portland. Um, and you can kind of see the light green area. It's uh, the algae covering the pond. Um, and it's kind of a funny story because this is actually a completely natural area. It's not a human made pond. Um, but it actually wasn't even originally a pond until very recently. It was a small stream or creek in the middle of the city. And some uh, beavers managed to work their way in the city, dammed it up, and it flooded this little forest and created a nice wetland. Um, there are no pipes bringing in urban stormwater, but plenty of runoff is coming over the nearby streets and industry in this pond. So it receives some uh, chemical pollutants. Now, when we raise tadpoles in this uh, pond where there currently are no frogs, because remember, uh, frogs are playing a literal life or death version of Frogger. Um, in cities like Portland, none have actually managed to colonize this pond yet. Um, but when we raised tadpoles of red-legged frogs in this pond, they did it really well. A lot of the embryos survived and hatched into tadpoles, and a lot of those tadpoles, tadpoles grew up and grew their legs and metamorphosed into little baby froglets. So it's a really cool example of how um, these ponds that might have a little bit of contamination in the middle of cities are super isolated and hard to get to, um, but they actually represent pretty good quality habitat for wildlife. And one of the ways you're thinking about actually capitalizing on this for conservation is to actually translocate and move some frogs into this pond and see if they can stick. Our data so far shows it's pretty healthy habitat. And so if we're lucky, we can actually create more frog populations by using these kind of uh, isolated urban ponds. So those are kind of my happy success stories. And I have a couple of less so happy stories. Um, so this is actually a really unique wetland. It was designated as a wildlife refuge in the city of Portland about 30 years ago, which is pretty cool to have a wildlife refuge in the middle of your city. Um, a completely natural uh, pond, but they did add some pipes to funnel in tons of stormwater off the urban landscape. Um, you can definitely see plenty of suburban neighborhoods just to the north of it, um, and huge scrapyard, junkyards, and kind of car lots surrounding the pond to the southeast and west. Um, and so lots of, lots of contaminants are getting into this pond. It's uh, pretty scuzzy in some ways from a water quality perspective. Um, but it's also kind of got a unique history from the amphibian perspective, but these uh, red-legged frog species that have been declining in the Northwest used to have a pretty strong population in the middle of the city in this wildlife refuge. And about a decade ago, they just disappeared. They were no longer present and they couldn't really figure out why it seemed more or less happy before that. And then we did, we put these apples again in the enclosures in this pond to see how well they grew.
And for a good long time, those little embryos turned to baby tadpoles. Those tadpoles grew into the big, nice, meaty meatballs of a, of a tadpole, grew their legs, and were just about to metamorphose. When we came back in late spring, early summertime, and they were all dead. We just had piles of dead tadpoles in all of our enclosures. Uh, they seemed otherwise healthy, but something about the water quality just did these animals in. Um, and so again, that gives a nice twist to our mantra. The solution to pollution is not dilution. Some cases not even evolution, but it's actually remediation. And there just kind of gets to be a point where there's just so much chemical con contamination in these urban ponds that some amphibians just can't take it. They can't adapt to it. They can't be resilient enough. Um, and that puts the, the burden on us to try and figure out how to stop pollutants from getting into these water bodies and to pull out those contaminants that are um, kind of holding on there for the year, for years and years to come. So that's one sad story. And I'll kind of close um, with one more story that's uh, a little sad, a little not so sad, it kind of depends on your, on your view of this. And this is this really cool um, kind of green space here, again in Portland. Um, this is actually not a natural green space at all. This is completely built by people. It used to be roads and concrete and buildings and eventually it was torn down and turned to this in large part because it was so built up that it was flooding people's homes and roads. And so they, they tore it down, built this green space, built this big lake, a few small ponds that are kind of hidden in trees there. Um, and over time, it's only about 20 years ago, um, for whatever it's worth, pretty, pretty recently, um, some cool amphibians, like again, these red-legged frogs, these long-toed salamanders, managed to work their way through the network of roads surrounding us and start living here in the ponds on this little, this little uh, 14 acre area, um, which gave us kind of hope that maybe these populations are actually gonna be pretty okay in dealing with the massive amount of storm water pollutants that are getting in there. Uh, so the populations aren't very big, there's only a kind of a, a few dozen animals that actually live here, um, but they seem happy more or less until we started caging some of these tadpoles in of the red-legged frog into these ponds. Um, and we found that most of them died. Um, not all of them, it wasn't as bad as the, the wildlife refuge I showed you previously. A few tadpoles managed to survive in each of our little enclosures. Um, but it does tell us that these ponds are actually, despite looking very pretty, um, have pretty poor water quality, poor enough to cause a lot of mortality and death in these animals. Um, but not so bad that we didn't get some surviving and turning into the next generation of frogs. Um, and one of the reasons behind this is that while that uh, pond behind the school that we showed uh, had frogs adapting to pollution, have been there for a few decades. Um, this is a relatively young pond. And so it might be that these frogs haven't quite had the chance to evolve yet to deal with pollution. So we're looking forward to keeping an eye on this population and seeing how well they do over time um, and see what they can learn to, um, if they can figure out how way to deal with this pollution. And so I kind of want to leave you with the last couple of thoughts. Uh, is this not going to play? Well, that was going to be a nice little video. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to show you anymore. Um, but from a tad, tadpole's uh, eye view of these, um, uh, uh, ponds, you know, they can seem more or less equivalent in terms of water quality, just from the way we look at it or the way a tap will concede it. Um, water can be clear, but it's really full of plenty of pollutants and how, how these animals will actually deal with pollutants. Um, it's kind of a mystery and that story differs from pond to pond. And some ponds might be covered with contaminants, you know, those frogs do well and others may seem um, healthy until you actually look at the tadpoles and they can't seem to make it until they're baby frogs. Um, so we've got a lot more work to do, but hopefully we can uh, have some nice success in uh, conserving amphibians in our cities. And the final thought, just to kind of give Chris something to work with before he, he gives his talk, is some of the uh, research we're starting to push into um, to advance uh, this kind of urban pollution work is thinking about the ways that social inequality, particularly racism, racism and classism, um, shape the urban landscape in ways that may have consequences, um, both for where we actually have uh, green spaces and water bodies um, and how polluted those areas are. Um, so this is a map of the various census tracts in Portland. Purple areas are lower income neighborhoods. Um, the darker purple areas are those that are actually experiencing the most intense levels of gentrification. Um, whereas the orange neighborhoods are those that are middle or high income census tracts. Um, dark orange being those that have uh, policies and practices that have pretty heavy exclusion of low income housing and, lo and low income um, people from being able to live there. Um, and typically when you have this sort of pattern across the landscape, you have uh, differences in power and where money goes. And so we're starting to think now about um, the ways in which um, the effects of gentrification and exclusion of certain types of people or groups of people um, from parts of the city shapes where pollution is and shapes how we might be able to um, hopefully create parts of the city that are healthier for everyone and healthier for wildlife. Um, so with that, I look forward to uh, chatting with you after this and I'll kick it off to Chris. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Max, for 
Thank you, Max, again for that kickoff. Um, and thank you, Liz, earlier for your talk as well. I'm super humbled and honored to share this screen with y'all and to really share this space and this stage and really talk to you guys about the, the combinations of what Max and Liz have been chatting about, where the biology and the biology of the organisms we see in our cities and how they're developing ways to survive really are, in essence, a, a real story about how we create the landscape. And with that, I think it's really important to address this point from our handsome Adonis from the early 90s, right? Again, Jeff Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park, who says life is finding a way. Well, certainly, as Liz and Max have already shown, life is definitely finding a way in cities to the point that I, I like to start this talk off by thinking about a story for me that really got me excited in urban wildlife. And I'm showing you here a photo, this photo of a coyote that was in Chicago 2008 in the summer, popped into a cooler. And some of you may notice that sign at the bottom, right? That sign is a Quiznos sign. So the coyote hopped into the cooler, walked into the Quiznos while there are a couple patrons eating their sandwiches, some folks in the back preparing sandwiches. Of course, everybody stops. Everybody stops. And they watch this animal walk through the store as if nothing was wrong, hops in the cooler, proceeds to fall asleep in said cooler, stays there for 45 minutes until animal control comes to take the animal out of the downtown Quiznos in Chicago. This question about how animals are surviving, how they're thriving, how they're persisting in cities has been a question that I've asked and certainly Liz and Max have asked as well, which brings us to this really important point that we human beings, right, society, we are both the directors and the audience of this particular play. The way in which wildlife are acting, how they're responding towards us, how they're responding in cities and beyond are essentially responding to the structures that we created. And we are the benefactors of those responses to the point that when we're thinking about how a system like urban ecosystems is influenced, is shaped, we have to integrate society. So society is huge in this equation because the way in which say, for instance, politics and economics paired with human health and demographics paired with culture and education, how those influence each other. And Max brought this up earlier, so did Liz. Transportation, right, and infrastructure all influence the way in which these organisms are surviving in our cities, therefore influences the ecological processes and the evolutionary processes that feed back into the way in which we operate with these animals. So I like to bring this up very much in, in many of the lectures when I'm talking about social ecological dynamics, right? This combination of feedbacks between social systems and ecological systems. And for those of you that don't know of the Lorax, right? The Lorax is this being who in the 2014 movie um, pl is played by Danny DeVito, which is completely apt, um, where the Lorax is talking about the trees and the importance of the trees. So stick with me here. We are going to go a little bit on a journey and follow said trees as if we were the Lorax. And to do that, I'm going to show you a side-by-side -side photo. These two photos are no more than a half mile apart from each other here in Tacoma, Washington. Now I could show you several other locations, San Francisco and the East Bay included, that look just like this. Now you likely already know where I'm going with this, right? On the left side, is a township called University Place. It's part of the larger Tacoma area. Um, and you likely already see the difference in color. If you are colorblind, you probably already see the difference in the types of built structures relative to the types of natural structures. Now, if you look at that and you compare the photo on your left to the photo on your right, what you'll see is the photo on your right, there is certainly much more impervious surface, like Liz had referred to earlier much more concrete roads, large roadways, built up structures like buildings, commercial, residential, or otherwise, and very, very, very few trees, very few vegetation covered structures. You likely can also guess where I'm going with this next step, right? The way in which these landscapes are shaped is not natural. It's by us, it's by society. And yes, 
the township on the left, University Place, is about $500,000 more in terms of median household income than the east side of Tacoma to the right. This influences what's known as this hypothesis called the luxury effect. This idea that species richness and biodiversity are positively associated with wealth. So where you see greater tree species richness and greater vegetation diversity overall, you end up seeing greater diversity of all types of organisms. So tree species diversity and what we call primary producers influences arthropod diversity in invertebrates, influences diversity for birds and lizards and other herbs, influences diversity for mammals. So at almost every level, wealth structures ecological communities worldwide. It should be mentioned that that's not always the case. So there are certain examples like Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, where different structured communities by wealth actually show a reverse. So low-income communities tend to have greater biodiversity. We'll get into why that's the case. But for those of you that are interested, I provide here references and last names of papers and when they were published for you to take a look at the many different layers that wealth structures these ecological communities. We are no different here in Tacoma and Seattle. We're very much interested in understanding this process for urban mammals. And we do that through many collaborative networks, the first being the Grit City Carnivore Project, which is this collaborative network between Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium, Metro Park Tacoma, and University of Washington Tacoma, as well as the Urban Wildlife Information Network, which is this larger network of camera trap enthusiasts, city planners, urban planners and designers, and wildlife ecologists all coming together to try and understand the fundamental rules of life in cities, particularly for mammals, but we're starting to branch out more into birds, invertebrates, and herps. So this partnership allows us to use this monitoring protocol that more or less looks at animals across this urban to rural gradient using these camera traps. We are 29 cities and counting. We've just got a city online down in Mexico and are hoping to bring cities online in South Africa as well. So for giving you all a bird's eye view at what that looks like for Tacoma here, I show you a map of all of the camera trap sites we have. And we've been monitoring urban mammals since fall of 2018. At any given point in time, we have about 29 to 45 cameras out per every month block. So that way we can look at seasonal differences and what animals are where. And we particularly have such a wide berth in cameras. And I'll get to this here in a little bit, because um, as you can imagine, when you work in cities, you're also working with people and you're also working with human um, organisms. So we get a lot of thefts of our cameras in our neighborhoods. But should be noted, I always like to give a shout out to the folks that started this particular UN project. The protocol was established by Dr. Seth Magley, Mason Fadino, and Liza Lehrer at the Urban Wildlife Institute at Lincoln Park Zoo. So since their work that started in 2008, we now have these protocols all across different cities to really address these really cross-cutting questions. And as I had mentioned earlier, right, we get a lot of theft, but you, you can imagine we get a lot of other things that are happening from our cameras. Everything from here, I'm showing you a photo of a master lock that was cut like butter. Um, so we have to beef up our security quite literally here, um, showing one of our sites where cameras were stolen. But also, and this is the case for many West Coast cities, um, one of the questions we can start to ask and address is how are wildlife distributions influenced by changes in homelessness rates? This is a photo taken recently, this week, of one of our sites where we just recently got a camera stolen and there was a new homeless encampment that was right at that site. So you can imagine some of the organisms that we may have seen in the past could potentially change as a function of the way in which people use the landscape, which then requires very new inventive subversion strategies to how we think about urban conservation and management. And then finally, one that I like to show for those of you that apologies ahead of time if you're grossed out by invertebrates and creepy crawlies, but it is October. I, I, I must indulge that we oftentimes will get earwigs that are in our cameras as well and literally in and outside of our cameras. If you're curious, these are earwig eggs. So for some of our cameras, they're also inadvertently really good pit traps. Pit traps are these uh, small traps that we oftentimes dig up the ground and then put a, a red solo cup sometimes in the ground and have inverts and other herps and whatnot trapped in there and we can count what species are there. But these lock boxes that we use for our cameras also inadvertently seem to be really good refugia for some of these animals. 
So we'll open up certain boxes and there'll be one or two earwigs. And then we'll open up some boxes and earwigs will literally rain out of the metal box. And that is uh, something you, you don't quite get used to. But of course, we always get the awesome photos of the cute and cuddly. So everything from black-tailed deer up here in the top left to our coyote who's inquisitive and searching the area to in the top right here, we have a family of raccoons practicing their parkour. And for those of you that have heard talks from me or have heard about talks before, I can't not give you videos of the cute and cuddly. So here's a video we just took actually during the week that Washington was put in stay at home orders for coronavirus, we got here a lovely little baby bobcat who is showing her stuff and just like, yeah, this is my land. What are you going to do about it? Um, so cameras are a great way of getting data non-invasively to really understand wildlife dynamics in cities as well as outside of cities, right? And this is really good for getting students involved as well as the public and the community. So what did we find, right? I had talked a little bit about the luxury effect and what that is and this positive relationship between wealth and species richness. Well, lo and behold, here are some preliminary data from a paper that Seth Magley, myself, and Mason Fedino and several others are working on that indeed show in Seattle here at the top and Tacoma at the bottom, this x-axis is income scaled by, excuse me, cost of a one-bedroom apartment and the y-axis is species richness. So even in mammals, across these different cities, we're seeing this positive relationship that the increase in income also results in increases in the number and types of species that are at a particular area. Why all of this is important is because we need to then ask the question, well, wealth is a proxy, right? It's a proxy for many of the dynamics that are coming into play in how the landscape is structured. Wealth alone doesn't describe or explain how certain neighborhoods became wealthy and certain neighborhoods became impoverished, we have to dig a little deeper. And by digging a little deeper, we have to understand how structural racism and classism influence the way in which many of these processes are then reverting into ecological and evolutionary patterns and processes. So all of what Max talked about, all of what Liz talked about, right? the changes in adaptive and neutral evolution, the changes in what animals can and cannot colonize an environment, the changes in where habitats actually are, are very fundamentally influenced by the intersections of residential segregation, resource allocation, gentrification, even law enforcement, all of which are influenced by systemic biases. So several studies, even in the last few months, have shown that impervious surface cover, urban heat islands, the distribution of green spaces and tree cover, environmental pollutants, resource distribution, and yes, disease dynamics, COVID being perhaps the best example, are all influenced by structural racism and classism. And for us to understand our natural and our human systems, we have to understand these structural inequalities. To the point that I want to bring to your attention for some of you that have not heard of this particular mandated policy before by our U.S. government, this policy known as redlining from the 1930s to 1968 was a systematic denial of various services to residents of specific, often racially associated neighborhoods of communities, either directly or through the selective raising of prices. So there are many stories from many elders of our communities that have talked about how these neighborhoods, which in red and yellow were deemed D and C regions, these were regions that oftentimes were proximal to industrial waste sites were oftentimes very far from green spaces, were oftentimes very close to heavy industrialized transportation structures. Whereas these green and blue areas were oftentimes wealthy, predominantly white, and had many, many more amenities relative to these D and C graded regions. Why is this important? Well, particularly because many of the policies that were US mandated had relegated black and brown communities to these red and yellow areas for, for, for decades, to the point that here I'm showing you a map if you all are interested in learning more about the, the history of redlining, I urge you to go to this particular link right here for the Mapping Inequality Project that's hosted by the University of Richmond. And I wanna point out to you here, there are almost all of the major US cities you can think of have previously been redlined. That includes Tacoma and Seattle, our region of study, but also San Francisco, 
and Oakland. We have a history of creating these maps that are mandated by our US government to segregate peoples. And that influences the natural system too. Here is recent evidence to that fact. So 37 US cities were recently surveyed by one of our colleagues, Dexter Locke et al. and several others in 2020, looking at how tree canopy cover is greatest in these A-graded regions. Now, mind you, right, the policy of redlining has been abolished for about 50 years. And we still see that these A-graded regions, and to some extent, these B-graded regions, have greater tree canopy cover relative to the C and D-graded regions. Mind you, it's not always the case for all cities. So Seattle is kind of on the cusp of significance. But the point being is that this is across all cities. Structural racism quite literally is influencing the ecology of our cities and dictates what organisms are going to be where. To that point then, if we consider this, we therefore need to consider environmental justice and anti-racism as modes of urban conservation, perhaps the most important modes of urban conservation and sustainability, which means that when we lead with these conversations, we need to lead with the ideas of deconstruction, reconciliation, and com community mobilization. And that also means subverting what we think of as conservation success and what a conservation action is. Everything from affordable housing to, yes, strengthening voting rights, all have conservation and ecological outcomes that influence the stability of the ecosystem that allows for these organisms to actually healthily live in cities, right? So that means that we very much need to think about how we treat each other as a way in which we treat our natural systems. And to that point, I, I just wanna conclude here with me, I started on this road and should note that, you know, Max Lambert is, is the senior author on the paper that we just wrote, and he likely will have some stories. So would Liz too, we've seen this when we walk through our cities. And for me, it started with this one puppy. We, this is a seven week old puppy that you are seeing at a, a captive coyote facility in Millville, Utah. This is where I did most of my dissertation research. We gave this particular puppy the nickname of Cal L because the dude was fierce. For those of you that are comic book fans, you will know Cal L is the birth name of Clark Kent, AKA Superman, right? So dude was straight fearless. Most coyotes don't get this close to you. I'm sure though, many of you, and I would love to hear, have stories about animals, coyotes, particularly in the Bay and how there's conflict there. So this animal is maybe 10 feet away from me and a little bit I'm panning over to the rest of his family, including his siblings. And his siblings are certainly a lot further away, including his parents. They're like, you got this cow, you're all good, man. We're rooting for you. Um, so this variation and what influences this variation in behavior has very much intrigued me and, and captured my intention for, for quite some time to the point that when you look at cities and how cities and different landscapes influence different behavioral patterns, it's hard to not make those connections between how we treat each other and how animals are picking up on that, right? For those of you that have dogs or cats, they pick up on your behavior. Same is the case with all other wildlife that live in our cities. So with that, I'd like to thank there are, of course, tons of folks that contribute to this work, as well as the other speakers. And for your attention today, I very much appreciate that. If you have any additional questions, I'll go, go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. But here's my email address, as well as my Twitter handle, and happy to answer what you have in the Q&A session with the rest of my colleagues. How's it going, guys? Good. Chris, that was always wonderful, Chris and Max, to see you, see you all talk. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm actually kind of curious to hear from you all. Like, you know, we, you know, Chris obviously talked a lot about uh, the human dimensions of how wildlife even exists in cities and where ecosystems function in cities. Um, the, the huge part of that is, is the human component. I'm kind of curious to hear both your perspectives a little bit on on your experiences with dealing with people and how you engage with people when you're doing your science. Um, and literally everyone's backyard, the places that we all live and work. And like, what, what's that like? What are your experiences that are kind of fun and or terrifying? Um, my, my experiences have been pretty good so far. Uh, I don't think I'm what people think of when they think of a wildlife biologist. Um, and I think people are not used to maybe wildlife biologists being in the city. So I get some surprising looks. Um, but I am, I want to acknowledge that I am a white woman that drives a Subaru. And so there is, 
<laughs> there is. And my my whole lab is in the back of my car. On my kit, everything is in the back of my car. So I'm I'm always with my car. I'm working out of the back of my car. Um the the times that I've been stopped by police, they've they've really just been curious as to what I'm doing. They always kind of assume that I have the authority to be doing what I'm doing. And that that kind of has always struck me as really interesting that that I am able to just go into these spaces and just completely allowed to do what I, what I mean sh I'm shooting something that sounds like a gun and it's you know I, I've been asked for my permits once and it was only because I offered to show the police officer my permits um, but but beyond that there are I've just had random people kind of come up to me, ask me, what am I doing? Pigeons are this great animal because they're never gonna bite you. And so it, for a lot of people, it's the first wildlife that they've ever held. When, they, when I hand them a pigeon, they're able to help me participate in that research to, to ban the bird, to label tubes. And you know, at one point I was in Philadelphia, I was in the parking lot of like a party city and this woman saw me catch these two pigeons and she came out just like, so what are you doing? It's like, oh, I'm a biologist. I'm trying to learn about how they're evolving. She's like, yeah, my kids just thought you were really weird. And I was like, oh, you have kids here. Do you wanna, do you wanna bring them out? And so she went and got her kids and I kind of hung out. And then she set up a couple of chairs that she had, some folding chairs in her in the back of her car. And we had an impromptu science lesson in the in the parking lot of this party city. And that's kind of been one of the the best things is this allows me a chance to get into these spaces and then talk to people about the community. Community members have the best intel on where pigeons are. They know where those pigeons are. And so I, uh, there's so much value in, in speaking to them, not only because I'm benefiting my own research, but because that is my duty as a scientist when I am in your neighborhood, I am a guest in your neighborhood. And it is my responsibility to take the time to talk to you and, and like, help you and to invite you in to be a part of this because it's so much fun. I think we all got into wildlife research because we like holding animals. <laughs> Chris, what have your experiences been like? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Liz. They've been all over the board, but <laughs> I very much am with you about how the community experience, ex just experiences really enrich the field. So um, this, this past week in particular, right, I was setting up a camera and one of the wildlife rangers had come up and said, hey, what are you guys doing? We're really curious. And I had a conversation with him about like, we are part of the Grit City Carnivore Project. We're really interested in understanding mammals and how they move through the landscape. And what was really cool was that having community members know about the camera also allowed us to optimize where we put said camera. So they would say, oh, hey, I actually saw a family of raccoons that crossed the road just 100 yards that way. We, are you curious about changing your camera? And of course, we're super flexible. We say, wherever you have seen the animal, that's where we're going to put it. So uh, we very much like to have folks come up to us and we, we chat with them. And then there are some of the ones that are like, folks are always curious, but there are times that are a little bit more hairy. So I showed you a lot of, of the, the, the community work we do around camera traps. But we also live trap coyotes and collar them with GPS collars and then see where they go. And at one point we were doing some, some research in Denver, Colorado with one of my postdoc mentors, Stuart Freck. And we had trapped an animal at like 2 a.m. in the evening <laughs> and we're processing the animal, making sure that it was healthy, doing all of the health checks, putting its collar on. And we had just anesthetized the animal. And all of a sudden we see a car that slowly rolls up to us and it turns its brights on. Now, mind you, just because we anesthetize an animal doesn't mean that it can't wake itself up. So if there are loud noises, if there are incredibly bright lights, it could pick itself up just like that. And that is a hazard, not just for the animal, but also for, for the people that are working around an animal because they could easily bend their head back, semi like an owl and just bite whoever. Um, 
So I have my hands on the animal, and Stuart, it, of course, it's a, it's a police officer that's slowly rolling towards us, and I have my hands on the animal. I say, Stuart, can you please, can you just tell him to turn the lights on so nobody gets bit? And luckily, he, the, the police officer gets out of his car and, and just wants to kind of see what we're doing and make sure that we're okay, which we're like, whew, everything is all right, but like had a little bit of a scare of like, Liz, you work with animals that don't have teeth. We worked with an animal that has teeth and was asleep, and we were still scared. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, the run-ins are are um, crazy. They're magical. Uh, uh, the questions we love the most, and we're hoping that um, we can start sponsoring kind of community gatherings for for folks to see what a, a coyote and a raccoon actually look like. Because most people just see them as ghosts in the plane moving at night away from them. Um, and we're hoping that when we build more of our capacity that we can have folks actually from the community participate with us when we're doing many of these health checks on the animals. So um, yeah, that's something we're, we're looking forward to. What about yourself, Max? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, thing. I think, you know, we all have experienced that people are dropping by randomly <laughs> to see what, see what we're up to. Um, almost, I can't tell if my favorite experience or maybe one of my most terrifying experiences is that I was in a, a DC, I was doing some work in Washington, DC in the middle of the city on frogs. And I was in this little pond trying to, you know, look at some green frogs and, and take some data on them. And um, a woman nearby in the park comes up to me and, you know, really vehemently asked me where my permit was. I had a permit for like being in that pond up to my chest and like mud and water. Um, so I, you know, had a permit, you know, talk to my waiter, so I pulled out and gave her this permit. So you know, I, I have permission from the government to be there and, and look at frogs and take some water samples. She, you know, to the great cool, asked a couple of questions and walks away. But her five-year-old daughter walks up to me and says, what's up with the frogs? And she just like looks at me and just like wouldn't let me get out of the pond. I need to get out of the pond, like take some measurements. And she, I'm getting covered in gunk, puts her hands on my hips and stops me from getting out until I put the frogs back. Cause she did not want me to like touch those frogs anymore. So it was like, I felt one glad the family was so interested in the well being on these frogs, but also horrified that I couldn't move. Um, but, you know, here in Berkeley, they've been doing a lot of work on urban pond turtles, which are a threatened species. And it's been pretty interesting to me to see um, the level of concern people have over like turtles here in, in the Bay Area. Whenever we're we're in Jewel Lake, which is up in one of the East Bay parks, right at the edge of Berkeley, and uh, we'll be out there a couple hours with some of the park, the park staff uh, measuring turtles and seeing how healthy they are. And you know, in the course of two hours, you can have four dozen people ask you, "What, what are you doing? Are you killing the turtles? Are you removing them? Are you hurting them?" Um, and it's, it's you know, always a really nice opportunity to talk to see how people are really engaged in their urban wildlife and, you know, people develop really close relationships with the animals so they can see, even if they don't see them, you know, turtles, you don't see in, unless they're like 40 yards away from you, but they still develop those kind of close relationships. So that's kind of the heartwarming part of, of dealing with urban wildlife and the people who, who also care about, care about them. What, what are some of the most more scandalous things? I'm sure, Chris, have you caught some things on oh, your camera man. traps? <laughs> we are yeah. at night school. We're at nightlife. <laughs> right. All right. All right. So I hope you all ready. Buckle up for this. So we've gotten, every, we've gotten everything from um, some of the, the less, like, innoc more innocuous stuff, I should say. Um, like just folks, like, kissing on camera or, like, staring at the camera. For those of you that are curious, no, we actually – don't really care if we get people on camera. Um, we point them down towards the ground. So we're actively trying to get some of the small mammals, like the voles, the rats um, that are scurrying or, along the ground, but folks still kind of like walk through. Um, and we've had folks tamper with the camera, poke sticks at the camera. We've had little kids shoot BB guns at the camera um, and to the more kind of severe stuff. So we've caught drug deals on our cameras. Um, we have had which you would think people see the camera. In some instances, they do, and they're doing it on purpose anyway. Um, they pee in front of the camera, literally, or they, like, expose themselves in front of said camera, all the way to folks having sex on camera um, and getting multiple pictures of, of that act and thinking, like, y'all know there's a camera right there. We put a sign that says... This is a research project for the Grit City Carnival Project. We only want to see animals. And somehow we still get all of it. We put our cameras in very secluded places, by the way. So like places where you wouldn't expect to see them. Um, it just goes to show, I mean, even some of our partners, especially say like in Chicago or things like that, um, many of our community partners are saying, if you get anything illicit or some type of crime, 
on camera that we would like to know about it. So we've had many like of our partners at City of Tacoma, City of Seattle say like, this is awesome. Please let us know if there's any tampering. So we kind of feel like we are informants, but not really because we're just wildlife biologists and we're not paid as informants. <laughs> And um, you're putting a sign up that says there's a camera here. I mean, we're pretty explicit. <laughs> like the sign is not small. It's a it's a it's an eight by five by eleven size piece of paper on a tree. <laughs> um, so you know, just stories from the fields in the mm -hmm. city. Mm -hmm. Max, do you? I'm assuming <clears throat> Max, you and Pons, because this is something that I come across all the time, is just the amount of condoms that I find condoms and underwear are just everywhere in the city. As soon yeah. as you go kind of off trail anywhere, the amount of condoms and underwear, I'm glad people are being safe. I 100% support safe sex, but there, there is a lot of condoms and underwear in our, in our cities. Oh yeah. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to tell you is I, I mean, I remember one of my, my best pond to study in a very urban dense region of uh, Connecticut um, kind of local park near high school. Um, and I put traps in the water to catch turtles, you these kind of big three foot long nets. And there's a slight flow to it, which means that anything you catch against those traps came from that night before. And every night I put out there, be a dozen condoms wrapped around these traps. And so you're sitting there with gloves, trying to, you know, pluck them off and, you know, get rid of them in a little trash bag. And it's just the most horrifying thing. It's, it's always kind of the problem with working with water, is that it always goes downhill, which means. You catch everything that's nearby, right? In that water the very next day. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, uh, it's one of the, I mean, this is one of those things that we are changing the environment around us. And so, um, yeah, I, I mean, again, like, I don't think I've ever done a field study where I haven't found condoms and underwear. It's just, <laughs> I just don't <laughs> think I've ever, and then there's more like illicit stuff. Like the first time I was um, doing field work in New York City, I actually, I was in a park and I slipped on the leaf litter and got up and was told, okay, you need to check yourself for needles because this is like, th these are kind of the safety issues uh, that we have to deal with as urban wildlife researchers. Maybe you might have a coyote that bites you, um, and we can and we have the opportunity to get to hospital and get to care as needed. But it it is kind of these other things that we have to think about in terms of like there is a very good chance. Max, you showed a, a needle in one of your your shots. Like there's a very good chance that we're gonna get poked. And kind of one of the scarier things I think we have to think about is that we might not know that we've been we've been poked we've been stabbed because mm -hmm. like when you're focused on the safety of the animal the, your safety kind of goes out the window which is quite scary um you all have probably woken up or gotten home to cuts and bruises uh that that you didn't even know were were there you were like i have no idea how i acquired all these bruises and cuts all over my legs but but it, right. they're there from from that work. Which I'm I'm really curious because I don't I don't think I've ever gotten a chance to ask y'all. But um, what? Because I'm sure many of many of the folks that are are look, listening to this live stream are like, how on earth do you get into the field of urban ecology? So I'm I'm curious to hear y'all stories of of how how you got to where you are. Um, for many of the even maybe some of the kids that are even watching. Max, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I can go first. I mean, I grew up in Phoenix, and so I, you know, literally showed Shanghai growing. I have a very similar video, visual I use a lot to, too. Because if you watch Phoenix from where I, where my first house that I lived in to like where it is now, you just watch desert and cotton fields disappear into development. Um, but at the same time, like the wildlife in Phoenix is absolutely phenomenal. You have tons of birds, you have tons of mammals, reptiles, amphibians all over the place. It's, it's a pretty marvelous city with wildlife. Um, at the same time, I always was really into the outdoors and hiking and, and you know, I always in my mind had, had viewed and was taught that conservation and ecology always happens in faraway places. You watch any of those TV shows growing up, not only do you have a bias in terms of the kind of identities expressed, but it's always discoveries happening in places that are far away from European and American places, right? In remote, in remote areas. 
And I was kind of always mystified by the idea of like remote areas um, and what that meant for, for wildlife. And I always wanted to be part of that. And actually I was lucky in college because I actually had a local project on, you know, an endangered species of turtle in a city that I got to work on. And I sat there for the longest time because I had gone through three years of wildlife conservation training at, you know, a really good school. And that single class ever mentioned the word urban. And here I was sitting in the middle of a city catching endangered species. And it was like a healthy population. I was like, oh, there's like weird things happening in cities and like, and turtles doing really well. And they're like really like species everywhere. And, I never, and just never put the context together. I was, that is like by accident, there are species there. Um, and, you know, as an undergraduate started digging into like, oh, there's a, a growing field of urban ecology and conservation. And like, what does this mean? Um, you know, that was back over a decade ago at this point in time. But I mean, urban ecology is a field that's really exploded over the past decade, but it wasn't really a thing. I think it's in large part because conservation biology and ecologists have always kind of viewed nature as happening separate from people. And it takes like, a number of these aha moments to realize that no, na you know, nature happens with people. People are part of that. And cities are are functioning ecosystems. There are plenty of species there. Some species will never get there. And that's something we have to, you know, deal with. But um, I got jazzed from the standpoint of having to, to having able the chance to work with an endangered species in the middle of a city. I think my story is pretty similar in the sense that I uh, I thought I wanted to live in the middle of nowhere and just be surrounded by wildlife. And so after college, I moved to the middle of nowhere to 130 acres. You know, we didn't, I didn't even have a key to my house. Like we just left the door unlocked all the time. I left my car keys in my car, middle of nowhere. And I got there and I really hated it. I found out that that living out in the middle of nowhere meant that I was disconnected from people. And I really w strived for that connection, those small interactions where I got to connect with my neighbors and strangers and those conversations in the grocery store line or while you're waiting for the subway and everybody's complaining about how horrible the MTA is or how, how horrible the weather is. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's never right. And, and kind of that community that comes together in a city. And uh, I didn't really have an understanding of what that was. I was like, how do I study wildlife in cities that people aren't talking about that? And I heard my PhD advisor on Science Friday. I was listening to Science Friday and he was kind of one of these first researchers to be going out and talking about urban evolution. It was, it's such a new field. We had for so long thought that evolution took millennia and this realization that evolution can occur within a couple decades just kind of blew everything that I had learned in undergrad out of the water and it it changed the way that I thought about things. And so, oh my gosh, there are these cities that are full of wildlife and how are we shaping our cities to protect humans and wildlife? One of the things that I love about living in a densely packed area is we don't have private green space. So our parks are full of people and everybody's like hanging out on the sidewalk and hanging out in the park. And my dog has all these friends that he knows. And there's just this wonderful, wonderful community. I feel like my block in New York City is this wonderful small town where we know each other. And that's what I want to be a part of. And I want people in these areas to have that same joy of nature that I got to experience growing up, kind of living in the suburbs. Chris, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I had always seen wildlife in urban areas. Um, I have several just like childhood memories of coyotes and raccoons crossing streets and that being a thing. But I didn't really put two and two together until um, I started like hearing folks excitement about it in other places outside of LA and it not being a thing. So I just thought like, well, yeah, of course wildlife live in cities, right? Like, yeah, of course there are coyotes that live in cities. But like when I started going, doing my undergrad and my grad work, folks were like, have you heard of this coyote or have you heard of this red tail hawk? Good example. So I, I, I was at Columbia University for my undergrad and in 2008, there was a red tail hawk 
in I think it was Midtown that had created its own, like it set its own roost on one of the tallest buildings in Manhattan. And people were freaking out. They were like, how is a red tail hawk in New York City? Like in Manhattan, right? Um, and of course, this hawk also gets a friend and has a partner and has chicks. So now they, they, put, a, they put a camera up on the nest and had a nest cam going and the entire city was a buzz this happened at the same time maybe a year right before um in 2008 the summer of 2000 no it was the summer of 2009 uh there was a coyote that got into manhattan and specifically got into central park and what really excited me about doing work on coyotes was how smart they were so they abated nypd for three full days like they could <laughs> nobody could catch the coyote it was literally just wild right and this animal was like nope i'm good in the city i'm gonna stay here and now of course right as liz probably can tell you there are many many folks now working on um the urban coyote project the gotham, gotham city coyote project in new york so um the ability for animals to kind of outsmart us it really intrigued me and i'm very much interested in all things sci-fi so of course things like you know Westworld, where the robots like outsmart you and you're just really curious about how they are outsmarted you so you build a system to learn about them but then they still outsmart you like that's how i feel when i work with coyotes and it just that maybe that drug just makes me keep coming back because that one time out of ten i could say i got you coyote but the other nine times I, they just completely humble me i think that <laughs> feeling of like humbleness is is great <laughs> in this thing because you you always are constantly learning you're always constantly learning. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. Love all your stories, but I want to save some time for some questions from our viewers. So I have a couple for each of you. Um, so I'll just kind of go around. But Liz, uh, what is the pigeon's place in the ecosystem? And what are the practical applications of understanding their genetic diversity? So place in, their, in the ecosystem, I want to kind of go back to this idea that humans are part of the ecosystem in cities. And for me, at least, I think that their place in the ecosystem is that they're providing a connection for humans to have with wildlife. And that might seem insignificant for a lot of people, maybe if you're wealthier and you are surrounded by more wildlife. But if you're a kid in the inner city, there's a very good chance that pigeons are the only wildlife that you're seeing and that you can identify. You might not know what a house sparrow is or a starling is, but you a pigeon is this identifiable wild animal. And so they're providing that ecosystem service to humans just by connecting them to wildlife. They're also, as Chris was just talking about, that red-tailed hawk is able to live in New York City because of the pigeon population. We've seen red tails, peregrine falcons increase in urban areas because they are feeding on the rats and pigeons that are in these spaces. So, so that's, that's the ecosystem service that they're providing both for, uh, for raptors and then for, for us as humans. And what was the other question? Sorry. What are the, no worries. Uh, <laughs> what are the practical applications of understanding their genetic diversity? Yeah, so who cares? Why why do we care about pigeons and how much diversity they have and if they form one population or two? But for a lot of places, pigeons are considered a pest and there's a big pest industry that's trying to eradicate pigeons. There, you know, they've been called rats with wings, and there's been this whole kind of movement to try to vilify pigeons. And so there are places that are trying to get rid of them. And by understanding that it's one giant population, if you try to eradicate pigeons in Philadelphia, they're just going to move in from Baltimore and New York because it's one giant population and they're just going to kind of move into that space. So from a, a management perspective, it's really interesting and helpful for us to know how to, uh, if we want to control, control these pests, which I don't think they're necessarily pests, but some people do from that kind of perspective. And then just from an evolutionary perspective, it's really interesting for me to understand how is something that is, 
a human commensal and and really living alongside humans how does do humans structure that wild population thanks liz um max is there anything you'd want to or wish to improve about the pond enclosure design in cities to help them thrive as amphibian habitats? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting kind of methods, a fun methods question for me. Um, the challenge with these sort of ponds is, I didn't really get to talk, talk about this, is that uh, some of these ponds, you know, are three or four feet deep when it's not raining, but because they're funneling water in from sometimes literally hundreds, if not over a thousand acres of urban development, when you have even a small rainstorm for two minutes, the, the pond level can go up to 10 feet, 12 feet deep. And so you actually have these immense uh, changes in hydro period. So I had to create these like cages that were on floats so they would go up and down in the water. So tadpoles weren't just like under 10 feet of water all of a sudden you're getting beaten about by flowing water. You know, what should be a pond turns into a river for a period of time. But because of that, the, the cages couldn't actually be completely in the middle of the sediment in these ponds. And that's one of the parts of these ponds you actually think maybe the most toxic is if you think about um, all the stuff that's running into these ponds from households and commercial areas and industry, it's usually fine particles of, of sediment. So it's metals, it's, it's gunk from your tires, it's whatever, you know, all these pesticides that cling to solid things and sink to the bottom. So they're not actually hanging in the water. Um, and tadpoles like to like hang out in the middle of that mud and they hide from predators that way. And so um, the cage doesn't allow us to actually have tadpoles hanging out in the mud and the dirt. And so the fact that we see some of these ponds where we actually have like 100% death in only water, what happens if the tadpoles are sitting in toxic sludge for a part of that day? Um, and we can't tell that from the way these cages are designed. And I, I don't have quite have an answer to that. So if someone's a clever engineer out there, I'm always happy to chat about that because it's definitely a, a challenge with working in, in urban waterways. Um, but yeah, that's definitely my big one. How do we get these ponds or these cages to be in the, uh, the, the mud? Thanks. Um, jumping to Chris, um, how can a non-scientist community member start doing work to reverse some of these long-term effects? Yeah, good question. Think about the way in which your square of influence, meaning whether you're in an apartment, a condo, a house, or otherwise, how you influence that piece of the landscape. And that oftentimes may mean planting things, that may mean participating in urban gardens, which also serve as really good hubs for many species across the city and can serve as stepping stones for, for a species to get from point A to point B, but also what it means to say, be a steward of your local nature. So we all have the ability to be stewards by learning more about the system, but also just observing those animals and doing much of the work that we do, which I like to think everybody is a scientist and even some of the things that we do are really, really simple and are just codified in the literature. For example, um, if you are really curious about the behavioral biology of either pigeons or frogs in your environment, you could do this really simple test called a flight initiation distance test. You just spot where the animal is, you walk towards it, and wherever it takes off, you measure the distance from where it took off to where you stopped. And that distance tells you a lot about how the animals are surviving in your city. Some, when you're in an urban area, that distance gets shorter because they're more tolerant versus others. So not only by planting things will it help, but also by learning more about the animals and how they behave towards you, it is this reciprocal learning that you are then understanding the species, but then also understanding your place in an ecosystem, which should be noted, right? Daily PSA for all of y'all out there. You have an outdoor cat, keep your cat indoors, right? That's the best thing you could possibly do to save biodiversity of small rodents and birds. And also number two, don't feed wildlife. I was just gonna ask you about that, Chris. Should we be feeling wildlife to help save yes. them? Like those, if, if you take nothing away for the rest of this talk, do not feed wildlife and keep your cat indoors. If you need alternatives, I have a cat myself. We have outdoor alternatives like catios for your cat mm -hmm. that, you know, get them the exercise that they need. Um, and that's for many reasons. One of the major ones being there was a recent coyote uh, bite in San Mateo. I think actually just not a couple weeks, a couple months ago. And they suspected that the animal that had done the biting was being hand fed. So there is this very much and we're hoping to take a look at the mechanistic links and the physiology from hormones to microbiome that relates back to risk-taking 
But over and over again, we see that the more you feed animals, the more tolerant they become of you, the more demanding they become of that food. And even though they may not bite you, they'll bite somebody else and they're expecting food from them and they don't get it. So right. I've actually noticed that in squirrels in New York City are very often fed. And if you walk towards them with your hand out, they will come up towards you. So instead of fleeing like they should with flight initiation distance, they will actually approach you. And that is rather startling and kind of terrifying because it means that it's looking to me for food, which it shouldn't be. It should be going after that natural instinct. I mean, there's a wild thing with turtles too. Um, red ear sliders are a common pet animal. Everyone wants to go all over the world. And most turtles, if you sneeze them in the wrong direction from a mile away, they'll jump in the water and get away from you. Sliders, if you come near their pond in the middle of the city, I've had it in Pasadena near LA, a whole army of sliders have walked right out of this out of this pond at me begging for bread, which is like the most duck-like thing you can imagine. But <laughs> turtles should not be doing that, but turtles will do it in cities. Uh, <laughs> horrifying, horrifying to watch. Do not release your pets either. If that, maybe yet. that should be the third yeah. thing. Do not release your pets into the wild. I hope everyone's taking notes. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question for each of you. Um, so Liz, how much do you feel the less urbanized space of Connecticut acts as an active barrier to population connectivity compared to the possible, to, possible idea that there's just little reason for flocks to cross a region with fewer resources? Yeah. Sorry, that was a long so question. <laughs> so I think those two things are probably connected. The the pigeon might not want to to risk kind of dispersing across that space because it might not know what's there. Although we do know that pigeons, I mean, these are the same pigeons that are like war heroes that carry messages that you've heard of delivering messages during World War II. Uh, these carrier pigeons had messages attached to them. So we know that they can fly long distances. And so there's there's something there about Connecticut that is acting as a, a weird barrier that I don't quite understand. And so the kind of natural instinct with this research would be, well, I need to go further north and further west to kind of expand and see where are those other barriers and what else is kind of shaping where these pigeon populations are. And so that is, you know, a lifetime of work that I'm excited to continue to be a part of. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of kind of, this answered one small question and it was only in the United States and only in the Northeastern United States. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very curious to kind of see how this, uh, this pattern that we found relates to South America, to places in Africa, to places in Asia that have pigeons. So I'm, I'm ex excited to expand this research and really kind of hone in on what is causing that, that break in the population. Cool. Um, Max, you mentioned that the solution to pollution is remediation, not dilution. What do you think would be the best way to remediate some of the ponds you've been working in? besides the design question you answered earlier? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you know, one of, the, one of the policy actions that's already taken place for most stormwater ponds is that they have to be regularly dredged out. So you actually go in there every few years, up to a decade, and actually use a, a backhoe and just pull out all that toxic sediment, um, which becomes a zone challenge. So where do you put a pile of toxic sediment? Do you put it in a landfill? Is there a special landfill for it? Um, so that's kind of one mechanism that's already in place. Uh, sometimes it's not always carried out in the time frame it should be carried out in. Um, uh, beyond that, the, the kind of biggest answer for remediation is once you clear that out, hypothetically, you've set that pond back to happy and clean, um, but that pond's gonna keep flowing with you know dozens or hundreds of acres of, of urban runoff going into it. And so part of that needs to be um, using fewer chemicals. So it's going to be a broader engineering problem for, for humanity. How do we reduce the amount of chemicals we use? And how do we, you know, do with, you know, there's, there's a whole field now called green chemistry. How do we create chemicals that are less toxic and, you know, dissolve themselves in the environment faster? Um, one of the things we oftentimes find in streams and ponds all over the place that are near roads is tire dust. And tire dust is full of heavy metals. So as you run your tire over um, asphalt and you hit the brakes, you can't see it, but a lot of the black dust flies off, and that's full of toxic chemicals. 
and all that runs right in. So that's what we have to figure out is how do we how do we really reinvest in technologies that really change the chemicals that end up on land? Because all like I said, water always goes downhill, and downhill is always into a pond or stream. So whatever happens up on land is coming right down to these ponds. Yeah. Um, so last question for Chris. Um, everyone loved hearing about the coyote. Uh, you showed a video clip of a coyote with a patch of fur shaved earlier. You you kind of told me and Christina the story about it, but uh, I was hoping you'd also share that with our viewers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for much of the work that we were doing with the puppies, it was pretty hard to ID them by just their coat color pattern because um, much of it blends into just like all brown. So we were trying to do multiple things with the hair. So we shaved them in different regions, either on their back or their abdomen, so we could ID which puppy was which. That allowed us to then make repeated behavioral observations of the puppies as they're growing up and see how their parents interact with them. But also, the hair is a really good kind of sample medium for us to understand the amount of stress that an animal has been undergoing on average over the period of time that the hair has been growing. So, for instance, um, you know, this hair has probably been growing for the last eight months, um, give or take. I cut it up a little bit for this call. <laughs> um, so like it's probably an average of three months of stress for me. You can imagine during the pandemic, that's pretty being high. <laughs> um, for y'all that have longer hair, right? Your hair has been growing for a lot longer. You pluck a couple of those hairs for however long you've been growing that hair. You, we, what we do is we put it into a high speed ball mill. It's these small little steel and titanium balls that go at hyper G forces that break up your hair into a fine dust. We then take that fine dust, extract all the hormones out of the hair, run it on an enzyme immunoassay, then it tells us what's the concentration of say cortisol or corticosterone. So that gives us a real good assessment of like what is environmental stress to each of those animals. And for us, we were able to link environmental stress of a puppy to its behavior. So animals may be like Kal-El, superbly bold, but it's not like there's no cost, right? So we call him Kal-El, but he has costs. He's He's more like Batman than he is a Kryptonian. Um, he does have certain costs. So he, can, he may be super bold, but he also has a very high stress profile, right? And high stress profiles under chronic conditions can reduce your re reproductive success. It can impair your immune function and impair many other physiological functions in your body. So like there, there are costs, right? There, there's an equivalent exchange, if you will. So that's what the hair was for. It's a longer answer, but... Um, you know, for however long you've been having your hair, we, we probably could run a study right now for everybody that's on this call. So like however long you've been running, like growing your hair or growing your beard, let's see how stressed America was over the pandemic. I feel like high, we've all been pretty high, stressed. Highly, highly stressed. stressed. <laughs> super high, super, super, super high. high. <laughs> um, on that note, I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. It was so great having the three of you, especially the longer conversation. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us tonight. I think I'm gonna bring on Christina now so we can say our farewell. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, another special thanks to Liz, Max, and Chris. And next week, we're going back 4.6 billion years to learn about the beginnings of the universe, why life on Earth looks the way it does today, and how to translate the fossil record into some paleo art. So come back next week for Night School of the Fossil Record. And then if you haven't heard already, and you are in the Bay Area, the Academy is reopening. Um, after seven months, uh, we open to members and donors on Tuesday, and we're opening to the public on October 23rd. Um, so nightlife isn't quite returning to the building yet. Um, we'll let you know as soon as, as we do. Um, but uh, night school, our online events, we're doing them on Thursday. We're here. Um, we're here. <laughs> Thank you so much for your support um, during all the time we've been closed and for watching and showing up and being such wonderful guests. Um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't miss one. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks again to our guests and for watching and have a good night.